I think let's get the. Sh you want me to record this as well? Well, we're well. recording already, so. Uh, okay. Right. Good morning, everyone. We're really super excited to be here today. This heralds the beginning of a partnership with Citadel, uh, which I think started on the 16th of February down in Cape Town, in a small art gallery in the middle of Woodstock, Cape Town, where I had the privilege of being introduced to Martin Ackerman, the chief economist. Um, and it, was, it proved to be a, a meeting, uh, a point of contact, uh, which has already heralded, heralded amazing results. And the fact that we are here today bears testimony to Citadel's commitment to the partnership. So to Christelle, to, to Rebecca, to Evelyn, there you are, and the rest of this, and Rion, of course, the Citadel team, thank you so much. And we are super excited at taking this relationship forward to the benefit of our membership and our partners. I think it, it, it augurs so well for the future. So thank you. Just some housekeeping rules. You're not here to listen to me. Uh, please, cell phones off. Cell phones off if you do need the facilities. It's where you came in. Straight down, men to the left and ladies to the right. Oh, that's oh, no, no. On further, further down. Uh, further down to the Still left. Okay, right. Thanks for that already, Christelle. <laughs> so, our partnership too with the Centre for Risk Analysis, we're so proud to have John Hendricks with us once again. John has addressed our membership virtually over the past two years, or twice every year. So we're very fortunate to be able to draw on his incisive analysis. Uh, he's going to challenge you. As a smaller group as we are today, uh, he's going to challenge you. But what you're going to hear is well-researched, credible information. Sadly, gone are the days where we could draw on our experiences in the media and attach any importance to assist us in influencing our decisions both in business. It is critical that chambers such as Second Cham creates a platform where their members have a voice, where they can be heard. And it is sad that having created platforms such as this, courtesy of Citadel, that we have what I regard as an unfortunate turnout. Those of you who don't know me yet are going to get to know me. I, I tend to call a spade a shovel. I don't endear myself to many people, but I am straight. So we're going to be talking seriously to our membership and saying, guys, it's not only about having the certificate in your hands or saying at dinner parties, this we members of second chain. There's an expectation, a real <coughs> expectation in concert with our colleagues from the High Commission of Canada, Trade Commission of Services, and I'm so privileged to have Alan Edwards, the head of head of them, their office with us today. Thank you, Alan. So we're going to have some tough conversation, conversations going forward, but it's necessary, I think. If we're going to be meaningful, if we're going to be relevant, those are the conversations that we need to have. We owe it to our members, we owe it to our partners to deliver on our mandate. But I'm addressing the wrong audience. You're all here today. <laughs> You're all here today. Thank you for that. Thank you for your commitment. And, and I know it's going to be worth your while. There will be a Q&A session afterwards. We'll be a roving mic. Uh, please. John loves questions. The tougher, the better. This is, this is a safe environment. We are recording, but we record it for the purpose of, of sending it out on our YouTube channel. I think not everybody can be here. We have members in Cape Town. We have members in Port Elizabeth, and I think we have one in Durban. Well, in fact, Martin's in Durban today. <laughs> so we, we, want to, we want to make it as, as accessible as possible. So without any further ado, I'm going to call on Christelle Lowe. Uh, just to make some opening remarks and then introduce John. Over to you, Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so glad you can be here. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to actually have this opportunity, Mike. Thank you very much. It's lovely to meet your members. Are we, looking, are we looking forward to working with you and hosting more of the events? Yeah, at Citadel. Um, I would like to actually introduce Citadel to you very briefly. Citadel is a specialist investment management company. And we focus on the investing of private client investments. So we provide an advisory service to secure assets under management for Citadel, but also to provide a holistic solution, whereby we look at retirement planning, estate planning, taxes, international and, and local investing for clients. Now, our business started 28 years ago, 
in Pretoria is a very humble investment business, and it's grown since then to a business where we manage 80 billion rand of asset under management. We've got 12,000 clients, we've got 80 advisory partners, and we've got a client retention rate of 98 to 99%. Now, the reason why that is very important to us is because it gives us confidence that the investment partnership that we have with our clients are very healthy. And it's a barometer for us to ensure that our returns and our service offering to clients are actually spot on. So we're happy to have you here, but the, the discussion today is not myself, but is Dr. John Endress, um, who is our speaker. John Endress is a director and CEO of the Center of Risk Analysis. He's an experienced executive and is solid, has a solid track record in retail, research, and nonprofits. He's skilled in negotiations, budgeting, business planning, communication, and strategy. He obtained two postgrad degrees, part-time, which we do respect, while working. <clears throat> he holds a doctorate in commerce and economics from the WHU Otto Beisheim School of Management, as well as a master's in translation and at Stadish Fruitvich University. The topic this morning is towards South Africa's tipping point. I think very, a very interesting topic that we're going to explore today. And it relates to how the political ground shifted in 2021, prospects for the policy reform and economic recovery, the future of conflict and cohesion, the opposition challenge, focus versus fragmentation, inflation and the fate of the great global asset price bubble, quite a hot topic for us as well in our industry, turbulence and the green trans transition. So Dr. Endress, without further ado, Stay short. Great, thank you very much for that uh, uh, welcome and kind introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be with here uh, to be here with you today. Uh, my name is John Endres. I'm from the Center for Risk Analysis, and we analyze risk and we try to understand what is going on in South Africa and across the world. When we do our job well, what we will do for you is try to answer three questions. The first is what is going on. The second is why is it going on? And the third is, what will happen? What's going to happen next? <coughs> and of course, each of these questions is more difficult than the previous one. But that's what we're going to try to do for you. Um, when we set up these briefings, they change from year to year, depending on developments in the country, in the world. And this year's topic for us is towards a tipping point. The reason we chose that topic is that with my background in change management studies, I'm very aware that change processes often aren't gradual but are often disjunctive. So you get a long steady state where nothing <coughs> changes very much, and then you get a very rapid transition where set suddenly a lot of change, uh, things change very quickly. And we have the sense that that is what South Africa is heading towards now, a kind of transition. That is why we call it towards a tipping point. It's a big call to make, and of course it may be wrong, it may be right. Always treat the information we give you with skepticism, apply your own discretion. Uh, but we think that there are a lot of signs pointing towards a transition. I'll take you through our thinking on that in this briefing. So, let me maybe try to get the little laser pointer up. So, there's there. 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 Fantastic. There. Okay, very good. Okay, so we're going to go through a, th uh, uh, a few different sections here. We'll talk about the state of the nation first, that is going to be our anchor point. We'll then go through reasons that explain the state of the nation, ranging from the economy, employment, and public finances, before moving to the section on whether we are likely to see a change and where that change is going to come from. We're going to talk about the growth fundamentals for South Africa. We'll talk about the likelihood of reform before getting into virtual priorities and discussing the possibility of a political shift in 2024. We will then close with some scenarios for South Africa, which is a CRA specialty. Um, which I hope will illustrate our thinking and also encourage you to ask questions uh, and to have a good discussion about these topics. Well, without further ado, let's get right into it. Let's talk about the state of the nation. And uh, you'll see that the image we've got up there on the slide is the July riots last year. Um, that was a very disruptive event, um, something that I think shocked all of us, certainly you know, shocked me as well. But unfortunately in South Africa, we could see the signs that this was going to happen sooner or later, and we also think that it could happen again. And you'll see, as we go through the presentation, you'll see the reason why we say this. So we start with a very simple question. 
which is something we asked respondents in some polling we did last year in September. We asked our respondents, is your life better, the same, or worse than it was five years ago? Very simple question, but it explains a lot. And the response we got from our respondents was that, um, as the bars come up, about one-fifth of respondents said that their lives had improved over the past five years, but four out of five said that their lives had not improved. They either stayed the same, which was 23%, but the vast majority, 57%, said their lives had gotten worse. Why does this matter? Because ultimately, the way that the public feels in the country drives the political development, but also drives the economy. And this is not the kind of picture you want to see. If you're a party in government, if you're in business or something like that, you want to see people saying, you know, I can see progress in my life. Looking back five years, today I'm better off. Looking ahead five years, I think I'm going to be better off. That's not what South Africans are saying. South Africans are saying they're stuck. We're in a situation where our lives are getting worse or staying the same, but this isn't great. So this is driving a lot of the unrest that you're seeing and the dissatisfaction. And speaking of the unrest, um, we measure or use police statistics to measure the state of physical protests in South Africa. The red line you see here, so this goes from 1997 to the present, to 2020 actually. This line only shows you the share of protests that are um, violent. In other words, where the police needs to employ force in order to bring the protests under control. And you'll see that there are two phases here. The first is one where there's pretty much a steady state, which is the first half of the democratic era to about 2009 or so. But then you see that the share of protest that is violent takes off and goes straight up up to about 30%. And this is a reflection of the fact that South Africans are not feeling happy with the way things are going. They also feel that their vote is not really making a difference. It doesn't mean that they are politically disengaged or uninterested, apathetic, don't know what's going on. They know what's going on. They just don't like it. And they don't know how to express it. So this is what you see. To give you an idea of the scale of the protests, the total number of protests per year is between 8,000 and 10,000. <laughs> Crazy number. Divide 10,000 by 365. There's multiple, there's tens, dozens of protests going on every single day in South Africa that we don't hear about because um, there are too many for the media to cover. So you only hear about the really big ones. Mangaung at the moment is undergoing protests. People are throwing stones, emptying rubbish in the streets. 16 people were arrested yesterday. Um, people are angry, um, and this reflects that. Also, the July riots, you can see where it fits on this trend curve. You can see that you know protests were quite low, but they've been getting more and more violent. In July, our interpretation of the fact is that there, was, there were very favorable conditions for a blow up, and all it took was a spark to be thrown into that uh, gunpowder barrel. That spark happened to be Jacob Zuma's arrest. And the um, kind of uh, communication that happened around that from supporters, that made it blow up. But that gunpowder barrel is still there. You know, we've still got the unemployment, we've still got the stagnant incomes, we've still got the frustration of South Africans with the state of the country. And that makes us think that if there's a new spark, there will be a new explosion. We are, we are really expecting that to happen. I think it's almost unavoidable. Okay, so this is the scene set up. South Africans aren't really happy with the way things are going. Why? You know, what's, what's, what's wrong? What's, what's going wrong? Well, let's look at the economy for start. Um, so we look at South Africa's GDP growth rate first, which is these red little bars going back to 1994 projected to 2023, so we've got some growth projections towards the end of that period. Um, and again, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that you can see two separate eras here, from 1994 to about 2008 is the first era. Growth was doing pretty well, we're topping out at over 5%, um, which is, is pretty decent, that was good performance. But since the global financial crisis and also the Zuma presidency, South Africa's economy hasn't grown properly. It's grown at around 2% at the beginning of his presidency, and then just declined, declined, and dipped even further, then really crashing during COVID. A little bit of a bounce back last year, um, I think it was 4.9%, um, and then the projections that we're going to go back to is really very low level growth, below 2%, which is not, not enough to make a difference in South Africa. Um, it also shows us, it's, it's a kind of smoking gun to government's thinking of the state of the economy. Um, so for all the, the talking up that happens, the finance minister does, doesn't believe it. He thinks that growth is going to stay low. I think he's right about that. So how did we compare to the rest of the world? We add these black bars, that is world average growth rates, and you can see very clearly the two eras. During the first era, the 
red bars and the black bars are about the same size. South Africa was growing like the rest of the world. But then you see this disconnect happening from about 2008, 2009. And the rest of the world is recovering from the global financial crisis, it's back into growth mode, and South Africa's stuck in no growth. You could say, well, we shouldn't compare ourselves to the whole world, but rather to the emerging markets, because we are one. It doesn't make things look better. <laughs> you can see that emerging markets really <laughs> have been pushing ahead with their growth, people getting wealthier, um, but South Africans haven't. And you do see that also, of course, in per capita incomes. Um, so this is just GDP divided by the number of South Africans. You see GDP per capita increasing, first half of the democratic era, and then really leveling out and stagnating in the second half. As we generated this chart, so I must actually point something out here. So we're currently at this, this level here. What is that? $73,000, $74,000, no, sorry, rand GDP per capita. Go back through history. When was the last time it was this low? It was here. 2005? Six. 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 Yeah. So that's like a whole decade of not making progress. It's not good. As we were generating this chart uh, with my, my colleague, Becky Machlobo, he remembered another chart that he generated, and he noticed that the, the shape of the two curves was similar. So we're going to overlay that other curve um, just to make a point. This is the amount of electricity generated in South Africa, the black line. And you can see how similar those curves are. Which makes sense, because those two things are mutually dependent. So you know, when the economy grows, you need more electricity to produce more, as we did during the first half of the democratic era. Then when growth flattens out, you don't need so much electricity, you don't produce so much, and it, it, it levels out. But conversely, also, of course, you can't grow if you haven't got electricity. And this has been the problem in South Africa, or one of the problems, at least. The lack of electricity capacity has limited growth to 2% and below. Uh, and as long as that constraint doesn't get lifted, we're going to be stuck in that sort of growth level. It's only one of the constraints, but it's a very important one. Um, <coughs> okay, just to illustrate the point again of, of how South Africa's fared over the past, um, what's that, 28 years or so. So here we show South Africa's GDP per capita as a red line, and we show the world GDP per capita as the black line. You'll see during the first half of the democratic era, those two lines move in parallel. That means South Africa was keeping up with growth in the rest of the world in GDP per capita. But since 2008, you can see how those lines drift apart, and ours is flat and dropping and the rest of the world is still going up. So the economy is definitely one reason why people are unhappy, but employment obviously is another cause. Um, and you're all familiar with South Africa's unemployment rate. I mean, that gets reported quite a lot, or just repeated. For argument's sake, um, I think the latest stat is 46.6% unemployment on the expanded definition, which includes discouraged job seekers. Uh, I don't actually have words to describe how bad that is. It is terrible. It is, it, is, it is incomprehensible to underperform that bad on employment. It's really, really bad. Um, but we'll give you a couple of um, different perspectives on the unemployment just to add to the insight. Unfortunately, it doesn't really make things better. The first is youth unemployment. Uh, about 50% are now heading towards 70%, 75% on some definitions. Uh, imagine being a young person just entering the labor market, <coughs> coming out of school, coming out of university. This is your chances of finding a job, it's one in four. <laughs> no wonder people are unhappy. Very, very bad. Um, similarly, if you look at for how long people have been unemployed, uh, people unemployed for more than a year is the red line. That has always been high at 60%, but it's still increasing now, going up to 80%. And the black line is people unemployed for under a year, um, which is obviously the mirror image of the other one. Those two are complementary. As Becky pointed out to me when we were discussing this chart, you actually want the, red, the black line to be above the red line. Yeah. Because you're always going to have unemployment, but the important thing is to generate jobs again and get people back into the job market. Not what our economy is doing. When the American economy crashed during COVID, you could see those unemployment numbers just skyrocketing up. But even then, I wasn't worried about America, because I knew that America, once the economy started growing again, was going to get all those jobs back. It's a very flexible, dynamic labor market. And here, it's not, not the case. You know, once you're out, you're probably going to get stuck in unemployment for a long time. Okay. To give another perspective on this, we did a bit of modeling. So here we show the labor absorption rate. That means the number of, the share of the working age population that actually has got jobs. 
this number in international comparison should be between 60 and 70 percent. Some countries go up to 80 percent labor absorption rate. South Africa is at the back line. Um, 43 percent at the start of the period we're looking at 2008. Flatlining and then declining during COVID, now at about 35 percent. This is half the level of where it should be completely insane. Um, the red line was our modeling, so we said what would have happened if South Africa's economy had grown at the emerging market average, and then our absorption rate would have gone up. It would now be at the lower bound of the acceptable rate for an absorption rate. Um, but you know, plainly that didn't happen. Um, you'll hear sometimes arguments about jobless growth in South Africa. Um, that is not supported by the facts. So in the first half of the democratic era, while growth was at 5% and higher, uh, the number of people with jobs in South Africa actually doubled. It was, there was a lot of job creation, but there hasn't been since, since 2008. Okay, so lots of unemployed people who are not very happy with the way things are going. This chart is one some of you might have seen before. Um, this is the number of people with jobs. Those are the red columns. Compared to the number of people receiving social grants, those are the orange bars. Um, obviously, <laughs> Very concerning. You can see the crossover point. Was it 2009? Uh, yeah, 2009, 2010. Suddenly, you've got more people receiving social grants than being in, in the works. Um, we always hasten to emphasise that the problem on this chart is not really the orange bars. The problem on this chart is the red bars. Um, social grants alleviate a lot of suffering, and they help people keep their heads just above water under very, very difficult the problem on this chart is that these red bars are much too short. Applying the modeling we did before on the labor absorption rate, if we'd grown at emerging market rates from 2008, there would now be 9 million more people in South Africa with jobs. So that red bar right at the end there would have been up over to about 25 million, and at the same height as the orange bar. Plus the orange bar would be lower because not so many people would be dependent on social grants. Um, so yeah, it's a very, I think a very eye-catching chart, but you have to interpret it the right way. The problem here is not the orange bars, the problem is the red bars. Not enough people with jobs. Okay, good. <coughs> right. Next we come to public finance. Is the finance minister, Mr. Gorongwana, uh, delivering his budget speech. So what can the government do about this? How can, it, how can it spend money to make things better? Very difficult, because there's not that much money around. To look at that, we show you how much money the government collects per year from 1994 to the present. I think with projections at the end, yeah, up to 2025. This is government revenue as a share of GDP. You can see that it is quite high, um, starting at about 20% and then gradually rising to reach 25 and 25 plus percent. So one quarter of all the value that gets produced in the economy per year, a bit more than that, gets collected by the government as revenue. That's a lot of money, but it still isn't enough. So the black line is how much money the government spends. And you'll see, firstly, again, that story of two halves. The first half of the democratic era, you see the gap between the two closing as expenditure is brought in line with revenue. And you see that really rare occurrence that not many countries ever achieve, which is a budget surplus. The government actually collects more money than it spends. That's a very impressive achievement one for which that um, earlier ANC administration deserves more credit than it gets. Uh, this was very well done. But then you see global financial crisis, you see the Zuma presidency, you see the taps being opened, and you see just spending taken off. So that black line is very, very high. Um, in round terms, South Africa collects one quarter of GDP as revenue and spends one third of GDP as expenditure. You can immediately see there's a problem there. Um, and of course, you have to, to close that gap through borrowing, through debt. Um, the red line is just the difference between um, revenue and expenditure. It's a bit hard to see here. Your, your zero line is about here. So if you're above zero, you're in surplus. If you're below zero, you're in deficit. You can see we are deep in deficit territory at the moment. We are so deep in deficit that we wanted to see how deep exactly in historical comparison. So we went back all the way to 1913 just after the Union of South Africa was created, to see what deficits have been like over this period. That's a lot of numbers. You can see them going up and down. You can see that sometimes they're really, really deep. And what this tells us is that the current 
level of deficit is exceptional in, historic, in the historical context, but not unprecedented. And it's happened three times before. The first was in the late 1980s, as the NP government ran out of money, as the apartheid state ran out of money. The American banks didn't roll over their credits anymore, and the government got really stuck. It ran out of money. Before that, it was the Second World War, it was war spending. Before that, it was the First World War, also war spending. So this sort of situation does happen sometimes, but it's quite unusual. And uh, students of history will know that subsequent to each of these deep deficit periods, there was a change in government. So in 1922, you had the Rand Revolt, the miners went on strike. In 1924, Jan Smuts was voted out of office. It was a new government. In 1948, Again, Jan Smuts was voted out and the NP government came into power, introduced apartheid. In the late 1980s, the NP ran out of money, and again there was a transition to the ANC government. And now we see that for the fourth time, as far as our records go back, we are in deep deficit territory. So will this pattern be repeated? We think it might well. Um, just looking at debt, um, so this is what funds the difference between revenue and expenditure for the government. Again, that first ANC administration did a really admirable job in halving debt as a share of GDP from 50% to 25, pretty much. Then the taps open, go full on debt, and we're now at a level of about 70% or so. It's quite high. We'll give you some comparisons, uh, some international comparisons to show how high that is. But we also must explain whether this is a problem or not because you know, it's normal for governments to have debt. Um, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. When does it start becoming a problem? And the time it starts becoming a problem is here. This is a very confusing chart, but I'll take you through it. What it shows you is the share of government spending <coughs> allocated to certain categories like education, health, the police, etc., etc., which is all fine. The red section right at the top is the one I want you to focus on. That is debt servicing costs. And what you can see is that towards the end of this period that we're showing here, that red bar begins to assume a wedge shape, and it's pushing down on everything else. So debt servicing costs are now crowding out government spending on other things. They are limiting the fiscal scope of the government to do the things that it wants to do, and they're also tying its hands if it wants to try to create change in the economy without fundamental reforms is running out of money, and that is going to be a problem. There's a course driven by two things. The one is the size of the debt pile, and the other is the amount of interest, or the interest rate that you pay on that. But South Africa has been downgraded a few times now. Uh, we're heading into a higher interest rate environment worldwide. So I think interest rates will continue to increase. Debt servicing costs will continue to increase, and that is going to keep pushing down on all of the other things that the government wants to spend money on. In the international comparison, uh, we've got a few selected emerging markets here just to see how they handle their debt and how we fare. And we see that we're not the highest by any means. Uh, Brazil's got a 100% debt to GDP ratio, but we are in the upper end of, 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 of those countries. And we are also one of the countries that added the most debt to its pile between 2010 and 2020. <coughs> But if you watched the budget presentation, you would have seen that the finance minister did not look particularly panicked. I mean, he did address the <coughs> problems, but he seemed quite comfortable otherwise. And he had reason to be comfortable, because he uh, had several Hail Marys that saved his bacon. <laughs> the first of these was South Africa's trade balance. So we know that mining did very well last year. Um, the miners export their, their ore, their commodities, and we get foreign currency in return. So we get a very nice um, trade surplus. In the historical context, you can see how big it is. That gray, shaded gray area is the size of the trade surplus. It's really very, very large. I think it meant 180 billion unexpected rands in the finance minister's kitty. So he was not feeling as stressed as he would have been otherwise. Um, what we worry about is that if you look at the revenue projections into the next few years, there's no sign that the government is expecting this windfall to go away. So the projections assume that revenue will stay at current levels and increase from there. And we think this is a mistake because windfalls, by the very nature, they come, they go, you can't plan them. Um, but it's dangerous to rely on this. So we think <coughs> the finance ministers mm, maybe being a bit risky there. 
The second thing that helped South Africa was the yield differential between local debt and United States 10-year treasuries. 10-year treasuries are like risk-free debt. That's America issuing debt, and you know they're always going to settle it because they can print dollars, they can pay anything. Um, so it's risk-free. But if another country like South Africa wants to borrow money from investors, then it needs to pay higher interest than that. And the difference in those interest rates is the yield differential. You'll see that there's quite a substantial premium on South African debt, uh, which is even climbed further. It means for the South African government, debt is expensive, which is bad. But it also means that the returns are good, which is good. It means that international investors in zero interest environments in the United States and Europe, they're looking around for yield, where can they get it? And they see South Africa, there's that country. It's pretty well run. It's got really good yields. It's got very liquid financial markets. You can get in quickly, you can get out quickly. Let's put some money there. And South Africa's benefited from that. So it's got lots of portfolio inflows, which have helped the finance minister closing the big holes that he's got in his budgets. But once again, this is one of those things that doesn't exist for always, forever. Um, you know, if interest rates in the United States increase, then that yield differential becomes smaller. And some of these investors will say, well, I'm actually not willing to accept that South African risk premium at this uh, new interest rate in the United States, so I'm actually going to pull my money out. And at some stage, you'll get this giant sucking sound, <laughs> that money going out, and then the finance minister will look a bit more stressed. We overlay the Rand dollar exchange rate, uh, but we're not going to make a call on that for you, because the Rand is known as the random in trading circles. Um, very hard to predict. Uh, I think long term, the trend line is clear and probably accurate. So you see long-term devaluation in the rand versus the dollar. Um, that is explained for various reasons, the simplest of which is the differential in inflation rates. So if our inflation rate is like 3% higher than the United States, then the rand will weaken by 3% per year on average. At the moment, we're in this very unusual position where the um, uh, dollar is actually uh, inflating at a faster rate than the rand. If this were to be uh, continued into the future, you should expect to see the rand strengthen but we don't think this is going to remain a permanent feature of the landscape. Um, I think this is a temporary thing. Um, the reason is that South Africa is such a small economy, we're going to be importing the inflation that the Americans are experiencing, um, and ultimately our, our inflation is also going to rise. Um, you do see some peaks in the RAND which sort of you know, strengthens a bit, um, probably explained through commodity rallies or uh, you know, other very large scale inflows. Uh, but overall, I think the trend is going to be a de devaluation trend. Um, what is driving inflation? One of the things is supply chains. Um, these charts just go back to the beginning of the year. <clears throat> Since that tension has uh, emerged between Russia and Ukraine, culminating in the invasion of 24 February, and you can see that the prices of several important um, commodities have really gone up very steeply, like aluminium, um, bread crude, of course, energy prices, nickel, uh, which is important for um, battery production. So as, as oil becomes more expensive, Traders expect a shift to electrical, electric vehicles. For electric vehicles, you need nickel, so lots of nickel gets sold and the price goes up. Um, we also show the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index, which is a recent index developed by the New York Fed. Um, they introduced it in January, but they calculated it back to 2015 very kindly, so you can see how much pressure there is on global supply chains. You can see those really big spikes during COVID, when you know, transport, logistics, manufacturing, all sorts of things got disrupted. It eased a bit as the second wave of COVID ebbed and vaccination started being brought in, and then it spiked back up again as the third and fourth wave of COVID hit. And this, you know, given the conflict in Russia, conflict with Ukraine, I think is going to remain quite high. So they're, they're, you'll continue to see pressure on supply chains, and a result of, as a result of that, you'll continue to see inflationary pressures in the United States, in Europe, and ultimately also here in South Africa. Okay, so not that much scope in the public finances to do something about the problem. Um, ultimately, the only way out of the very high um, deficits that we're running at the moment is growth. Um, if this was an economy that's growing at five or eight percent, no problem, you, you'll be able to pay for the debt pretty quickly. That's not what we've got at the moment. We've got some constraints on growth, and we'll just cherry pick a few for you. The first is electricity. What we show you here is the energy availability factor that is how much of ESCOM's generating plant is able to actually generate electricity per year. We started in 2011 with 85% availability, and that has declined consistently all the way down to below 60% now. And it is mirrored by equipment breakdowns, which is the red line. 
that is unplanned power outages. And we're now at a level 27%, so a quarter of all of ESCOM's generating capacity at a given time is breaking down because of lacking maintenance, because the equipment is getting old, maybe because of sabotage in some cases as well. But overall, the picture is one where you see that this is not a, not a healthy trend. It's also not a trend that shows you that you're going to fix this problem very quickly. Uh, to fix this problem, you know, those breakdowns would have to go away, which they weren't in the short term, or you'd need to expand total capacity. And we, you know, with Magrupi and Kusilia, we've seen the problems with doing that. The solution here is going to be private generation, um, which is beginning now, but far too slowly, we think. So we think load shedding is still going to be with us for the next two to three years, and it will continue to be a cap on growth. As soon as you see growth, sort of ten tentatively, timidly edging up, load shedding comes back, and whoosh, growth goes down again. Um, yeah, and we'll get out of that once, once we've got more power. The second thing we look at is education. So you need a skilled workforce in order to have a growing economy. Just one data point here. We show you the grade one class in 2010, 1.1 million school children, and then we follow this one class, this cohort of school children, all the way through their schooling careers to see where they go. And we see that as you go through the schooling, more and more kids drop out. So by the time you reach grade 12, about 350,000 kids out of 1.1 million have left school already. Out of those 750,000 that are remaining, um, 700,000 write their metrics, and 537,000 pass their metrics. This is the metric pass rate that the basic education minister tells us about in January each year. She divides the number of passes by the number of kids who sat to write the metric. It's around 75 to 80%, which is then uh, promoted as a, a, a great success. But it's not. <laughs> because the numbers you need to put in relation is actually the number of kids who passed the metric versus the class that started in grade one. And you can see that's below 50%, and that's, that's not good. So the education system is, is failing huge numbers of South African children and school leavers, making life very difficult for them. Out of those who pass the trick, um, about half do so with grades good enough to get into university. Again, it's a problem because you want lots of tertiary educated people. It's better for a growing economy. Um, and you can look even more closely at that group of those 250,000 school leavers. Um, and look at the number of them who pass maths with a grade of 50% or higher. And that's 50,000 children mm -hmm. out of 1.1 million who started their school career in 2010. And that's a big problem because you know if you want to get to the fourth industrial revolution, uh, you want banking, finance, insurance, um, technology, engineering, um, the science to be advanced in South Africa. All of those things which really grow economies. We're not producing the skills, the manpower that we need for that in sufficient numbers. Um, so that's another constraint. It doesn't matter um, how much education you get, it does. So we show you here the labor absorption rate by highest attained level of education. Um, and it's just, it just stands out immediately. So if you've got anything less than a tertiary education, your labor absorption rate is very low, uh, comparable to the general population. Um, it means your chances of finding a job are not very good. If you do have a tertiary education, your labor absorption rate is comparable to that of the rest of the world, 70%. So it's actually really important to get kids into universities, TVETs, training colleges, getting diplomas, getting some sort of um, education after school. Um, you do sometimes see stories on social media of uh, graduates who can't find jobs. Um, and I think there's a perception out there that even though if you've graduated as an engineer or architect or mining engineer, you won't find a job. There are cases like that, but it's not the norm. And usually I think young people who display so much drive to need and want to get into university are actually, they've got the right assessment. They know that this is going to really improve their chances. They're right about that. Um, another constraint on growth is our gross fixed capital formation. What this describes is the amount of money that gets invested into fixed capital, that means factories, your plant, your machinery, your heavy equipment, your infrastructure, the kind of stuff that stays around, you can't put it out very quickly, and it allows you to make more stuff or to move other stuff around. You need that to grow an economy. 
South Africa, compared to other emerging markets, should be at a level of 23 to 25% of GDP um, with its gross fixed capital formation. But we are actually at a level of 14%. So uh, very, very low. Um, the National Develop Development Plan in 2012 said that South Africa should aspire to a level of 30% gross fixed capital formation to GDP. We're very far away from that. Um, you see the spike in fixed capital formation up to about 20, 2009 or so. Um, I think that's partly a result of good economic policies, macroeconomic policies, but also, of course, the Soccer World Cup. So this was building of stadiums, the upgrading of highways, the car train, and so on. But nonetheless, you, you need that, that sort of level of investment in order to, to grow the economy. Um, haven't got that at the moment. Think of the railways, the roads, the ports, um, those are the things you need to get your stuff moved between markets within the country and to get it out into other markets. And all of those are not performing well at the moment. Not at all. Okay. Um, also, consumers aren't feeling very confident, and our proxy variable for that is uh, passenger vehicle sales. Um, just looking at the trend line, you can see it's seasonal, so it spikes up and down a little bit. Um, but overall, the trend is going down. What it means is that people are driving their cars for longer um, rather than replacing them. Um, and that is because they're feeling uncertain. They don't know if their job is still going to be around a few years from now, if they have enough income. So I'd rather fix up the old car rather than buy a new one. Um, and of course, the consumers aren't spending, and that's another reason why the economy isn't growing. So that was our growth fundamentals. I'm not looking so good on those. Um, so clearly something has to change. Um, and what we need as a country is reform. Um, we are getting some reform rhetoric, but we're not buying that it's the right kinds of reform. Um, the image we chose here is the unfinished bridge in Cape Town. Um, and so the metaphor is that there's lots of talk of reform, but it's not going anywhere. Um, if you listen to the finance minister in the budget speech, he talked about fundamental reforms being needed. But the examples he gave were things like spectrum release. It was like easing visa applications. It was infrastructure spending. Those things are not, that, that's not what, what's going to shift the economy onto a high growth path. That's tinkering around the edges. It's sort of fiddling a little bit to try to make things a little bit better. But it's not going to do what we need it to do. Um, so we show you here a picture of the, the cabinet. And we speculate about whether we might get the kinds of reforms that are needed, which are which have pills, but are really hard reforms. Firstly, are we going to see action on corruption? Um, we went and looked at the 80 ordinary members of the ANC National Executive Committee and uh, looked to see whether there were serious allegations <coughs> of corruption against any of them. And we found that 41 were implicated in serious corruption, serious enough to go to jail if they're guilty. 31, we couldn't really say, and eight, we think, are not implicated. But now picture yourself being uh, Mr. Ramaphosa. Uh, and, and uh, pretend that this is a world where he wants to combat corruption, as he has proclaimed on many occasions, this makes it impossible for him. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if the authorities really went after the corrupt, he would be challenging the majority of his top management, his top executives. Um, so we, we think what you're going to continue seeing is lots of rhetoric around anti-corruption, but little action. You'll see the occasional scapegoat being chased around the country, like Mr. Mahashule, or see the hawks swooping in on the Gupta compound after the Guptas have left. Uh, and the, the media will report and say, it's finally something is happening, and arrests are imminent, etc., etc. but they're not really. Um, so this is all for show. Um, secondly, we ask, uh, are we going to see economic reforms? And what we mean here is not uh, the spectrum release and, and visa amendments. That's irrelevant. Fundamental reforms mean ironclad guarantees for property rights. You can't have something like EWC, prescribed assets, NHI, cancelling of bilateral investment treaties, and expect investors to put their money into the country. You can't. Secondly, you need very fundamental education reform. You need to fix the education system, because otherwise you won't have the skills to get the country growing. You need to do something about electricity at a far more urgent pace than you are doing at the moment. Get the private sector in there. You need private power generators to be selling into the grid, uh, competing on price, expanding capacity in order for the economy to grow. We're not seeing that. 
we went and looked at the cabinet, and these are now percentages, and we wondered you know, which cabinet members would be in favor of the kinds of reforms that I've just described, which are very, very hard. We realized that. And we also need labor market reform, by the way. Um, unpalatable and politically sensitive. We think 81% of the cabinet are anti-reform. They think that the current trajectory is actually fine. We must double down, must do more of that. Um, so we're still pursuing EWC, we've got the new land courts bill, for example, now which is effectively an EWC court that, it, that the, the government is trying to introduce. We're seeing doubling down on um, uh, race-based employment legislation with the Employment Equity Amendment Bill, currently before the National Council of Provinces. Most of cabinet is in favor of this. There's about, what's that, 19% um, who we think you know, are possibly open to reform. Pro-fundamental reform, we're not seeing any cabinet ministers. Um, we had Mr. Mbawaini in that camp on the previous versions of this slide, he threw up his hands in the end in frustration because he just couldn't make any headway um, with, with his plans that he left. So currently there's no one who's going to bring any reforms. Um, could you say that maybe Mr. Ramaphosa actually really wants to introduce reforms, but he doesn't have enough authority within the party? Mm -hmm. Remember at the early days of Ramaphoria, there was talk of the mandate threshold. And people said, you know, he sort of just squeaked into the presidency doesn't really have a strong base within the party. Now, he can't go wild introducing reforms. You know, he'll be kicked out before he knows what's happening. Is this still true? We think it's not true. And here's another result from our polling last year. Um, we polled the favorability of political leaders. Mr. Ramaphosa polling at 60%, head and shoulders above any political leader in South Africa. He's very, very popular. As a matter of fact, he's more popular than the party that he leads. The ANC got 46% in the local government elections, Mr. Ramaphosa at 60%. If they cut him off, they're going to drop much faster. And they know that, so they need to keep him inside the party. This gives him a lot of political potential, <coughs> which he could deploy if he chose to, um, but he chooses not to. Um, and we, we think this is not because of timidity or feeling that his hands are bound, but because he is actually a, a party unity man. The unity of the party is the most important thing to him. We'll do nothing to challenge that. And also, he is committed to the ideological program of the ANC. So you saw in the January 8th statement, a recommitment to the National Democratic Revolution. This is the line that we're going down, and we're going to continue going down that way. So you're not going to see fundamental reforms. This path is now set that we're on. Um, however, for what, as long as we are on this path, we're not going to grow, we're not going to create jobs, and South Africans are going to continue to be as frustrated as they are when I show you that very first slide. So the, the way to, to break out of this for South Africa is actually going to be through a political realignment, um, through a change in government. And that means that you have to look at what voters care about, because ultimately the voters hold the power. Um, South Africa is a, a very free country, with a lot of freedom of speech. We've got fair, free and fair elections, and ultimately voters decide what happens in this country. So what do voters care about? We ask them. Do the polling, this is from September last year, and we asked them what are the two biggest problems that the country is facing. You can name anything you like. We've done this for 10 to 15 years with varying polling companies, all of which are you know, recognized polling companies, that use representative samples that ask the question in the mother tongue of the respondent, make sure that you balance in terms of race, um, gender, uh, rural versus urban, etc., etc. So it's a proper polling. Um, the results came out like this in our last round of polling in September last year. And what always strikes us is that the results are always the same. They have been the same for the past 10 to 15 years. Unemployment is what South Africans worry the most about. And that's not going to surprise you. You've seen the unemployment figures, you can see how bad the situation is. So what people care about is getting jobs. And you'll see, second in the list is the abuse of women or children. That is, uh, a surprise to us because that entry has been there in the list before, but never as high as last year. We think that might be because August is the month of awareness about women and children, uh, child abuse. And so when people were asked about this, they said, yes, you know, that campaign has just been happening, so that, that is a very big problem. And of course, it may also be that under the <coughs> impact of the COVID <coughs> lockdowns, the loss of jobs, of people being cooped up together under lockdown, um, there probably was a lot more abuse of women and children than there would have been. 2019 before COVID. So that's a big issue. 
Um, what we've seen in previous polling, however, is that the next issues after unemployment are always the same in a varying order. On the one hand, it's climate safety, obvious. People don't want to get marked on the way to work uh, and corruption. And then service delivery issues around education, health, housing, water, electricity, really basic things. That's what South Africans care about. I think this is an accurate, accurate representation of voter priorities. What we see a lot in political discourse and in the media, however, is a focus on the issues at the bottom of this chart, and that includes racism, EEE, land reform, and inequality, be it racial, gender, or other. We'll see that the ANC and the EFF spend a lot of time on these topics, and not so much on the topics at the top. And the reason for that is that it's very hard to deliver on the topics at the top. You could be measured on it, and if you fail to deliver, you can be punished for it. Topics on the bottom, you can fudge it a bit. You can say racism is getting worse, we're doing something about it, we've got the Human Rights Commission now looking at racism and advertising, <coughs> we've got the, uh, what is it, the Employment Equity Commission looking at transformation in business, etc. We're doing things about this, the pace is very slow, but we're working on it, we're passing new laws. Um, but ultimately, voters aren't rewarding this because it doesn't reflect their priorities. They're not getting what they need, which is jobs, service delivery, and climate safety being combated. Um, as a result, many voters are staying away from the polls. You see voter turnout dropping. Those people who are staying away, we think, are not uninformed, stupid, or unengaged. They care about what happens in the country. They care about these things, but they're not seeing any party giving them these things. They're giving up hope gradually in the ANC because they see it's not coming. The EFF, I think they don't quite trust. They don't trust the DA either. And then there's lots of smaller parties, and they'll say, well, is this a a wasted vote or should I vote for this party? So it's reflecting the politics. We think, however, that a party that can make a credible sale on the top issues will do very well because there's that huge pool of non-voters, twice as many non-voters as there are ANC voters in South Africa that are up for grabs. So if you're an opposition party or if you're the ANC, you've got to focus on that group and think, how can I talk to them? How can I sell them something that they want? What, what do they want? Look at our polling, we'll tell you. Um, we also looked at, at race, race relations, um, of course a huge topic in South Africa given our history. Um, the public impression um, I think might be that the different races are at each other's throats, can't wait to drive each other into the sea, can't bear to be in each other's company, that's not what the polling shows. Um, so this is just one of the questions we ask we ask have race relations improved, gotten worse, or stayed the same. The majority of people say they've improved since 1994, thank God for that. Um, but across other questions, we also see it. Uh, we ask people, have you experienced racism in the last five years? A very small minority of people say they have. Um, interestingly, in our latest polling, there's quite a high share of white and Indian respondents who res replied yes, they had experienced racism in the last five years. With black respondents still very, very low, it's in the sub 10% range. <laughs> what this tells us is that South Africans are actually very moderate, middle of the road, kitchen table kind of issue people, politically. They are not at the point of slaughtering each other for being a different race. They are able to work together and they care about really fundamental conservative small c issues. Is my family okay? Can I send my kid to school? Can I have a decent job? Can I get to work without being mugged on the way? There's nothing, nothing radical in that. It's not the message that you're getting from the EFF, for example. This is really basic, basic stuff. Uh, and South Africans aren't getting that at the moment. But they want it. Maybe they will get it. So, almost at the end, uh, thank you for your attention and, uh, and focus so far. Um, we first look at the political shift that we're possibly seeing. There's the union buildings, there's South Africa's growth rate, you're familiar with this outline by now, the two halves of the democratic era. And we've often shown this chart together with support for the ANC, which is the orange line. And again, you can see this very nice mirroring of the two shapes of the, of the graphs. When Nelson Mandela led the ANC to victory in 1994, the party was riding on a high of popular support, called well over 60%. And then something really amazing happened, which was that Thabo Mbeki and his two elections led the ANC to even greater heights. 
So Tauben Beek, he secured more votes for the ANC than the great statesman, the great icon of liberation, Nelson Mandela himself. And why was he able to do this? Because the economy performed. Mm. Let's see, people were getting richer. Jobs were being created. And the party got rewarded, as it should be. And then growth tanked, and the ANC support started declining. At the same time as the share of non-voters increased, which is something we don't show here, but you must keep it in the back of your mind, because those non-voters are very important. We add for you little dash nine, which is the share of the EFF, and we put the ANC and the EFF together in the same camp, because they, have, they share common origins, um, and in many ways they share a common ideology, in the one case more radical, and the other less radical, but based on the same principles. Now, if you were to go along this entire history, you'll see that the ANC or the ANC EFF has been very stable since 1994, between 60 and 70%. And if you look at the opposition, it mirrors that. It's been very stable between 20 and 30%, or 30 and 40%, rather. And as an opposition leader, you might say, you might pull your hair out and say, you know, we've tried everything, and it's been 28 years, but nothing changes. We're stuck between 30 and 40%. The NC and the EFF forever is going to be between 60 and 70 percent. There'll never be change in that. But of course, we saw in the local government elections a very important change. It was the first time that we broke out of this, these tracks, these tracks that seemed so solid. Um, and I must emphasize, of course, you can't strictly compare national elections with local government elections. They have different results, different dynamics. But still, they're adding it because we think it's very important that the ANC drop below 50 percent for the very first time on a national level. What it did is um, it scratched or tarnished the, the aura of invincibility that the ANC used to have. The ANC was the juggernaut that could never lose and always got the most votes. And now voters are looking at this and they're saying, hmm, so it doesn't actually always get the most votes. That's very interesting. EFF sort of stayed at the, at the previous level. Even if you add them together, they've gone down. And you can see those two lines looking like they're beginning to converge. There's a little blank section on the, on the right of that chart, um, which I'm going to fill in for you now. So what you've seen so far is fact, and what I'm going to show you now is speculation. I just want to make that very clear. That's why it's got a question mark. So we wonder, what will happen if we don't get growth? So the ANC is not going to get rewarded for it. We won't see its share of the vote go up. The EFF doesn't really break out of its 10% to 12% corridor. And the ANC drops further. Well, then you might get to that point right on the far edge in 2024 where that black line and that orange line cross over. And you will see that the ANC and the EFF will not be in the majority, mm -hmm. but rather that an opposition coalition of whatever nature might be in the majority. And what do we make of that? We think this is now a realistic prospect. Um, before the November elections, we didn't. That was not, not really part of our expectation, at least not for 2024. We didn't think this was going to happen in 2029. But now, um, this may happen earlier. So this is the, the potential shift that we are flagging for you today. Um, just taking a quick look at our estimates before the election. So we polled in September. Uh, we got the ANC at 50.5% in our polling with a margin of error of plus minus 4%, which really didn't tell us whether we should put them above or below 50%. They were right on that line. So there was a lot of uh, head-butting and very uh, passionate debate within our team about where we should call the ANC ultimately. We called them at 49. We said they're going to drop below 50 in these elections. We put the DA at 22, the EFF at 12, and all the other opposition parties together at 17. And what actually happened is that the ANC um, came in lower than we'd expected, right at the bottom end of our margin of error, 46%. The DA we called right on the EFF, we were a bit too optimistic. They came in at 10% rather than 12. And then all the other opposition parties got 22%. That number 22 is very interesting because in 2016, in the previous local government elections, that number was 11. So, so smaller opposition parties have made a really strong showing in these last local government elections. As a matter of fact, they're not as strong as the DA, as a collective. It's the same number, 22%. And this is going to determine that the future of South African politics is going to be determined by smaller parties, not by larger parties. We think that the, the period of ANC dominance was an anomaly, given that we've got a proportional represent, representation system. And what you should expect to emerge from such a system is lots of small parties. 
because there's no threshold to get into Parliament, for example. So you can have as many small parties as you like. All you need is one seat, and you're in. That's going to be the future. Um, Helen Ziller, in an you know, article on Politics Web on Monday, wrote about how terrible it is to manage coalitions. And I'm sure she's right. <laughs> because you've got small partners, and they jump off, and they jump on, and they demand things, and you have to give them things, and it's very volatile, and so, so difficult. And she was complaining about that. I understand completely. But she probably won't have a choice, and nor will other politicians in South Africa. If you want to be successful in, in, in politics in South Africa in the future, you need to know how to manage coalitions. It's a big ask, but it's not impossible. Um, I'll just give you a quick reminder of the non-voters. Um, and I'll focus on the far right column, just in the interest of time. Voter turnout as a share of eligible voters, that's everybody about eight, the age of 18 in South Africa, consistently increased all the way to 2016 higher 42% and then really dropped to 29% in the last local government elections. It's a reflection of, of unhappiness with the way things are going, but also a reflection of specific conditions that surrounded these elections, like for example COVID, like the level chilling that, that happened in the weeks before the election, uh, like the uncertainty about whether the election was going to be postponed or held as required by the constitution within 90 days after the expiry of the previous terms. Um, and there was only one registration weekend instead of two. So all the reasons why turnout was low, um, but nonetheless, there it is. Non-voters are very important. Okay, we've come to the final part of the presentation, which is the scenarios. Uh, and before I get into those, um, you'll see a picture of buffaloes in the background. I don't know if you can see it from your handle, I can't see it from here. Um, so we, the way we try to understand South Africa's political landscape, what we say, that the African savanna has been dominated for a very long time by a dominant buffalo. It's a huge animal, muscular and powerful, that nobody could really challenge. And commentators and analysts you know, were always interested in the contest, and they wondered whether a lion was going to emerge that was going to take down the buffalo. Was there going to be a strong party that was going to grow its share of the vote? And uh, keeping with the metaphor, the lion was going to leap out from behind a bush, a tall grass, onto the buffalo and take it down. And in election after election, the commentators and observers were disappointed because there was never a line. Mm. And we now think that there never will be a line. It's not the kind of political system we've got. But what there will be, we think, is a pack of wild dogs. Mm. Wild dogs are small animals. A single wild animal, uh, a single wild dog cannot challenge a buffalo. The discrepancy in sizes is far too big. But a pack of wild dogs is a very fierce predator predator with the highest kill rate in Africa. It's the most successful predator that exists. Mm. A pack of wild dogs usually, when they're amongst themselves, are sociable, but they also snap at each other and they fight over scraps and you know, there's quite a bit of tension in the pack. But when they get the scent of the prey into their noses and they start to hunt, they can be very focused. And this is the scenario, one of the scenarios that we're going to describe for you now. You'll see the imagery and the, the names that we've chosen for the scenarios are linked to that idea of the buffalo and the wild dogs. When you draw up scenarios, the way you do it is that you identify two key factors that determine the outcomes of the thing that you're looking at. In our case, it's South Africa's future politically and economically. We think one of the most important factors is going to be whether the ANC remains above 50% or drops below 50%. And the second is whether we see fundamental reforms the bitter pills that I mentioned earlier, or whether we don't get such reforms. And so if you map those two axes against each other, you get the four quadrants, and I will fill in those four quadrants with you, with the names of the four scenarios, and then I'll explain how, how we explain each of those scenarios happening. Top right is that the ANC stays above 50, and you also get a very effective reform strategy. And you see really sweeping reforms across a, a range of sectors. Well, I'll get to the reasoning afterwards. I'll do that one by one. We call this the Buffalo Charges scenario. The second one is that the ANC drops below 50, the, the wild dogs make the kill, and you get the effective reforms that kindle, rekindle growth. Third scenario is the hyenas plunder the carcass. And that is where ANC drops below 50 and you don't get reforms. As a matter of fact, you might get a doubling down on harmful policies. And the last scenario we call the Buffalo Stumbles On, which is we don't get reforms, but still the ANC stays well 
will now explain to you the, the reasoning behind each of those. So here you see the, the buffalo giving a wild dog a good chase, um, chasing it away, looking quite rampant. And the way it plays out is that you get, so the agency is in power and it introduces these sweeping reforms across labor, empowerment, energy, education, and property rights. As a result, you see growth taking off and going back to those 5% levels that we saw between 2005 and 2007. And you get all the good results that come out of that. You see debt first flattening, then coming down. You see the currency strengthening. You see job creation resuming its, its old trend line. And you see living standards improving. The ANC gets rewarded for this, as it always has been in the past. It's the confidence in the ANC <coughs> rising, and the ANC gets a moder moderate majority in 2024, and then a really strong majority in 2029. So that's, a, that's the buffalo charging, storming, um, and, and uh, making sure that nobody is under any illusions as to who is dominant on the savannah. The second scenario is the one where the wild dogs make the kill. And then you see the wild dogs going after a poor old buffalo. Um, the way it plays out is that the reforms are delayed, so we're in our current state. The ANC drops below 50% in 2024. <coughs> This is the conservative version of our scenarios where we say you get these five years of unstable coalitions because these wild dogs can't work together. You know, they, they're trying, but they keep fighting with each other. And some will leave the pack and they will rejoin and it'll just be a big mess and, and not, not very good for governance. But by 2029, voters are gonna be really fed up with the situation. Mm -hmm. See a new political player emerge who's looked at our polling and has seen, okay, we actually need these bread and butter issues, we need the kitchen table issues to be addressed, not the squabbling, to just get the stuff sorted out. And this new player then dominates the coalition, introduces the reforms that are needed, and gets rewarded in much the same way that the ANC did in the previous scenario. This might happen sooner than we think, so this would be the proper tipping point. The third scenario is the hyenas plunder the carcass. How that happens is as follows. So we, we don't get reforms, ANC drops below 50, and it goes into coalition with a populist or nationalist party or parties, like the EFF for example. And we think that in that kind of coalition, even though the ANC would be the larger partner, the EFF would be the dominant partner. Mm. Uh, because it's far more focused, it's far clearer on what it wants. Um, it has a you know, far better understanding of, of its objectives and we think would be able to impose those within the coalition. As a result of that, you would see expansive EWC asset prescription, nationalization of banks and mines, as is written in the EFF party program. The consequences are easy to anticipate, um, and this is literally the Zimbabwe or Venezuela scenario, where you just see the debt and deficit going to sky high levels, currency being printed, hyperinflation, and investors and skills running away as fast as their feet will carry them. If this happens, living standards drop steeply, and in 2029, by the time the next elections roll around, the ANC EFF coalition will realize that they can't stay in power under these circumstances because their performance is far too bad. So they're going to restrict civil rights. So not so much freedom of speech anymore, some political prisoners, some tampering in the election, whatever's needed to stay in power. It's a very bad path for South Africa. The fourth scenario is um, Buffalo stumbles on. And here what we see, and we're almost at the end, is um, that we continue to get reform rhetoric as we have been getting, but it is fruitless. It doesn't really go anywhere like that bridge I showed you earlier. It just sort of ends in nothing. As a result, economic exclusion deepens. What we mean by that is more unemployment, more poor people, worse education, um, sort of just really this grind of hard poverty deepening. But contrary to other scenarios, the ANC has been able to make use of this opportunity. <coughs> and we see that <coughs> pop, and we see that ANC support levels are highest amongst people without a job. The poorest respondents in our polling, people with the least education, and people in rural areas. So there's this possibility that you see these groups increasing in number where the ANC support is the strongest being able to make use of this to stay about 50%. At the same time, of course, the opposition would not really be making use of the environment that it finds itself in. So, what do we say? Fail, uh, fails to exploit. It flies.
flounders, it fails. <laughs> exactly. Um, it doesn't go anywhere. And as a result, South Africa sort of trundles along, much as it has for the past decade and a half, not going anywhere and gradually um, declining gracelessly um, as things continue breaking down and don't really get better. And those are the four scenarios. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. And I thank you very much for your attention. Take a few questions. How are we doing time wise, Rebecca? Are we okay? I have time. You have time. Thanks so much. Questions? You all absorbing it? I don't have name. Right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, John. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Just half of which one of words have you chosen? Also, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my question really relates. You said that under the Zuma administration, the taps were opened. Yes. It wasn't one man opening the tap. Correct. It was a whole yeah. plethora of a variety of people and processes. And so what actually happened that led to this disaster? Okay. Um, so let, let me start with the second question first. So what 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 led to the opening of the taps and the, the disaster that we've experienced over the past decade and a half? The reason for that, I think, is to be found in a, a realignment of the ANC that happened when Zuma got elected and won at the, at the ANC internal elections in 2007, I think it was. So, Thabo Beki had introduced an administration that was quite pragmatic in many ways, uh, with severe failings as well, but one that delivered in terms of macroeconomic stability, growth, job creation, etc., etc. He seemed to be pretty much firmly in the saddle. But he committed one very big mistake, and that was to deploy Jacob Zuma to KwaZulu Natal to bring KZN back to the ANC and to get it out of the grasp of the IFP, which Jacob Zuma did with a great deal of success. <coughs> what Mbeki didn't realize was that he was creating an opponent for himself with a very large power and support base in KZN. Mr. Zuma, very astute political operator, realized that he needed to build a coalition in order to take over from Mr. Mbeki. And he built this coalition out of a combination of forces that were ideologically left, that was one grouping, and that was interested in enjoying the spoils of incumbency. In other words, corruption, on the other hand. These were two groupings, two distinct groupings. I think that Mr. Zuma personally was not particularly invested in ideological questions. He was happy to leave this to ministers like um, Patel, for example, and Davies. Um, which means that by default, the kind of policy environment we got was a left-leaning policy environment. More interventionist, think of localization, think of industry master plans, um, you know, think of um, expanding the welfare state. So the whole thing was, was, was left-leaning. It was not free market oriented. But the interests of these two groupings coincided in that, in that both of them wanted to increase state spending. The one grouping for ideological reasons, because they believe the state to have this important developmental role in, in society. You need to have a big state for that. You have to spend a lot of money. The other grouping, because that gave them access to money flows for patronage purposes. So the state capture phenomenon was only one half of the explanation for why the Zuma era was so bad. Yes, the corruption was huge and it was hugely damaging. But on the other side, you also got the policies that stopped growth. And the combination of the two brought us to this point where we are today. Um, I think that, that ultimately is the, uh, the explanation. So it wasn't Zuma who opened the taps, but it was convenient for him to open the taps both for ideological reasons and also for patronage reasons. And so that's what we got out of it. Um, and as for your first question, you know, which, which one's going to happen? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I must. So mention two things about the scenario technique before I continue. And the first is that when the scenarios are done by um, academics and proper experts, they say that each of these scenarios must be equally likely. And if they're not equally likely, then you haven't done it right. Um, I'm not an academic, so I didn't specialize in scenario technique, so these don't quite balance into 25, 25, 25. Um, and I'll give you my take of what where my, my sense is of what's going to happen. Um, 
But before I do that, the second caveat, which is that whichever one I tell you is the most likely is not the one you should prepare for. <laughs> <laughs> the scenario technique, what it does is that it says you must place yourself in your imagination into a future where any one of these four things can happen. You must place yourself into these four futures. Today you must prepare for each one of those four futures. And the idea is that when one of those eventually materializes, you are prepared for it, you're not being blindsided. Mm. Okay, so this is how to use the scenarios. You must prepare for all of these eventualities. You must set yourself up for it. And then you'll be okay. That, that's, that's, that's when the technique works. That having been said, my sense is that I can very, uh, with, with a high degree of confidence, say that the top right scenario is not going to materialize. I do not see any chances of fundamental reforms coming out of the current ANC. Um, I think the party is in a terrible state. Um, I think its members are aware, aware of that internally as well. Because they can feel that they are in danger and at risk electorally, but they're not getting the leadership that is going to get them out of that hole. Mr. Ramaphosa isn't providing it. And if they look around themselves, I don't think they see anybody else who's going to provide it either. And without that leadership, the ANC is not going to be able to turn things around. It's going to have to keep going down that route that it is on at the moment. So that scenario I'm going to give like a, a residual 5% probability to make sure it stays on the, on the map, but I don't think that's going to happen. Let's look at these other three scenarios, and I would assign almost equal probability to the buffalo stumbles on and to the wild dogs make the kill. I think those are the two most likely. Why would the buffalo stumble on after what I've just told you about how difficult things are for the ANC at the moment? Well, it stumbles on because it is a very large organization with a lot of popular support, with a lot of access to resources, with a lot of organizational and institutional momentum behind it. It's like one of those huge good trains on the Nullarbor Plain in Australia with a hundred wagons of four behind it. If you apply the brakes, it'll just keep going. You know, keep going for a long time. And the ANC is like that. I think it's a juggernaut. It's a very big organization. It doesn't turn on a dime. It doesn't change direction quickly. So if nothing else happens in the surroundings, by default, it'll just keep going on. And we'll, we'll have a, a long period of graceless decline, is how I would describe it. The bottom right um, is not a scenario I would assign 50% probability to, but I would also not say that it is in the single digits. I think there's a realistic chance of this happening. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some reasons why I say that. Um, after the November elections, Two days later, we wrote an article explaining the wild dogs and buffalo scenario. And we caught a lot of flack for that. <laughs> People said, you guys are mad, it'll never work. You know, you, you see these opposition parties, they're all fighting with each other and their leaders are stealing each other's wives and they're competing for the same voters. They can't possibly work together. But now you look around you and you see in Johannesburg, there's a wild dog coalition in government. In Swane, there's a wild dog coalition in government. In Ekuroleni, there's a wild dog coalition in government. Each of these coalitions is in power against all odds, in some cases much to their own surprise. For example, when the DA in Johannesburg put forward its mayoral candidate, was not expecting her to be elected. It was not expecting itself to, to find itself in power. Um, but the EFF very unexpectedly lent its votes to the election of the DA mayor, and we ended up with a wild dog government. And these surprises happened in the Kurolini, um, and Swanek was not quite as much of a surprise. But in any case, we ended up with these, with these wild dog governments. That was only the first hurdle. But there are so many other hurdles to cover. Like, for example, the election of the chairpersons. And you saw the toy toying and the protests and so on. And you thought, well, you know, they won't manage this hurdle because their coalitions will break apart before they can elect their chairpersons. But they crossed that hurdle. And now we've got chairpersons elected. And these councils are able to start working. The next hurdle was the passing of the um, adjustment budgets. And you thought, well, surely they can't agree on money, which is always the most divisive issue, but they did. They have passed their adjustment budgets. The next hurdle is going to be the proper budget in May. And there'll be hurdle after hurdle after hurdle after hurdle, but the fact that they've come as far as they have already increases the likelihood of that red scenario, that bottom right scenario. 
we're seeing a proof of concept in the making right now. These parties also need to realize that they're not just working for the residents of the city. What they are doing is important for the country as a whole. Because in 2024, if these coalitions survive, they will be able to point to their successes and they will say, no, we are diverse and we're all different, but vote for us because we can make it work. Look at Johannesburg, look at Swane, look at Ukraine. So the job that these coalitions have is very, very important and they have to swallow many bitter pills and uh, accept a lot of squabbling and horse trading and terrible deals that they have to make <laughs> just to stay together and show that it can be done. So this gives me the feeling that this Wild Rocks Make the Kill is not as outlandish as it would have seemed you know, in September last year or October last year. So those two for me are the most likely scenarios. The bottom left one with the hyenas plunder the carcass is the, the scariest one and the worst outcome for South Africa without doubt. Um, it's not negligible probability, um, but I think lower than the, the two across the other diagonal. I'll give you one reason for that, which is if you think of the, the dynamics of an ANC EFF coalition, you must imagine that it is the day the results get announced at the results center in Midrand. The ANC comes in at 45% and wonders how can it get a majority. And they will think, should we pick up the phone to the EFF? Should we call Julius and try to build a coalition with him? And they'll wonder and they'll think, that hell, Julius is so dangerous, he's so focused, he knows what he wants, he's very strategically smart, he knows all our secrets, and he's got moles in the organization, he used to be one of us. If we bring him in, he's going to put half of us in jail before we know what's happening. <laughs> and then he'll take over, and he'll put in his own policies. And I'm sure he will do that. He's ruthless, he knows what he wants, he's going to get what he wants. And I think the ANC knows this as well. They'd have to be pretty desperate to do this. From the EFF's perspective, they're looking at the ANC, which is a sort of crumbling organization, bereft of ideas, bereft of, of money. Um, so you know, they, haven't, they weren't able to pay their employees for before the local government elections. Imagine that, how terrible that is. Um, they haven't got money. The state is running out of money. Um, the, the, it's running out of support. It's a sinking ship. Are you going to tie yourself to that as the EFF and say, yeah, that, those are the guys you want to work with. <laughs> Look at the guys that are going down. And so the EFF might also say, well, maybe not such a good idea. Actually better off doing what we're doing now, you know, being independent, being autonomous, being disruptive, representing who we are. So that, that bottom left scenario is very scary. Um, but I think you know, maybe 15% or so. So that would give you 5% for the top right, 15 for the bottom left. You can put 40 on the, the other two. Sorry, your mic. Did you put the mic? On? Sorry, I didn't. I think. Oh no, it's on. It's on. Yeah. Just into the mic. The wild dogs Great make job. a kill. Don't you think um, the open border policy that DSS is pushing will actually alienate them from the wild dogs? In your opinion? Yes. Because I mean, South Africans care about their own and the, the country and the economy. Yes. So I mean, this is a huge issue. Um, we, we saw Action as A using this as a campaign tool first. I have talked about closing the borders, getting rid of undocumented foreigners in South Africa. And ASA performed well in the local government. They didn't stand everywhere, but where they stood, got really good results. So if you think back to January, February this year, you saw the EFF going to restaurants to check you know, people's papers. You saw the Patri Patriotic Alliance doing the same. You saw the IFP with submitting a private member's bill to Parliament about foreign workers. You saw the ANC going after foreign workers. All of these parties are now trying to steal some of that thunder, and they wonder, you know, maybe we can get some votes if we do this. It's a very, very dangerous thing for the country because we've had this in vogue violence in 2008, and balancing on that line between the hatred of foreigners and the implementation of law and order and secure borders is such a fine line. And I'm very worried that this rhetoric, 
even if it is on the right line of law and order and secure borders, is going to so easily tip over into kick the foreigners out, close down their businesses, kill them, etc., etc. So that, that's a real risk. Um, yeah, I was on, a, on an interview with Ongani Baloi about immigration. Um, and we got along surprisingly well. Um, but I, I did emphasize this to him. I said, you know, I understand that you're using this as your issue. It's a valid issue. But God, you've got to be so careful about how you said it because otherwise the consequences can be really terrible. Um, but I also, also think gets neglected in the case of the, the foreign workers in South Africa is that ultimately what you're seeing is a problem with law enforcement and governance, which is being taken out now on the foreigners. Right? So if, if uh, you, you hear talk about Zimbabweans being criminal and they're all the cash and transit heist and the Nigerians on the drug trade, etc., etc., and each nationality is associated with specific crime, that's a very bad thing. But ultimately what should be happening is that if somebody is involved in the drug trade or committing cash and transit heists, the police needs to go out after them and prosecute them. It doesn't make a difference if they're local or not. That's not the deciding criterion. That, doesn't, you know, that should make no difference. But the police are so bad at doing that, that foreigners are getting away with the crime. At the same time, as South Africans are getting away with the crime, that then the message you can sell is that you can say, look, the foreigners are all criminals and the police isn't doing anything. That's the problem. Um, and then in terms of governance, of course, Home Affairs is not doing its job very well. Both in terms of securing the borders, but also in terms of managing the process of uh, foreigners in South Africa. So, you know, if, if, you, if you're a legal foreigner in South Africa and you're trying to apply for permanent residence or, or, or citizenship, it's a nightmare. It's, it's almost impossible to do. So many foreigners, they'll say, well, just walk across the border, it's a lot easier. <laughs> Why should I bother to deal with this terrible home affairs department? Mm -hmm. I think we have one, one down take. Another two, so one here, and then you're right that really <coughs> Good. Just on those scenarios and a possible black swan event, and I'm not talking externally, I'm talking internally, coming back to, to the riots in, in June and July. How do you, and again, I'm talking broad black swan, so like in a car accident, EFF, lying in a bus accident, whatever, whatever the case may be and the impact that might possibly have on any of those outcomes. Yeah, so I don't think that the July riots last year were an attempted coup. I don't think that people with the skills to carry out coups were involved in it. But I do think that people with the skills to carry out coups exist in South Africa. And I think they observed with great interest mm -hmm. the unfolding of events in July. And they might have said, well, look, you know, you can sort of get quite a, quite a good number of people going in riots and protests. You're not really seeing the police or the army getting involved. So maybe there's this opportunity, you know, for an overthrow of government. This is, a, I think, a black swan event in, in the sense that it's hugely unlikely. It's not really see something I, I think is going to happen. Uh, but it could happen. And what, what, what that would do is that it would take us outside of this scenario set. The scenario set is premised on the idea, firstly, that South Africa is a free and open society and a democratic society. So what determines the outcomes is not the decisions of a group of people plotting to overthrow the government, but the decisions of ordinary South Africans and ordinary voters. Once you take that assumption away, then it's a different ballgame. Um, and I think you know, that is a possibility, but I think a very slim one. I think that democratic culture and the desire to have the freedom to make decisions about your own life is a very fundamental part of South African culture now. Um, you know, South Africans were oppressed for many, many years under apartheid. They tasted freedom, and I don't think they're going to give it up very easily. Last question. There will be an opportunity for some networking if you have some questions after. Thank you, John. Uh, as always, uh, there's an awful lot to unpack here. You know, my, my question, of course, I always preface it something that I'm that guy who's not South African, talking about South African politics, so uh, take it for what it's worth. Um, but, you know, when you, you break these down, everything on the left um, is scary to me, obviously, um, when I look at it. 
uh, and everything on the right, when we're talking about the effect of reform, we're really talking about the kinds of reforms that are free market. Um, and um, I have to admit that since I've been here since September, I've been kind of surprised by how default the position is of many South Africans that when they talk about job creation, they expect that to be the government doing it for them. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm stumped by how revolutionary it was that the president mentioned that the private sector creates jobs in, in the Minnesota address. So, you know, to me, it's obviously, in, in order to, to get to the, the places on the right, uh, we have to start talking to people uh, and getting them to accept the ideas of privatizing, uh, you know, many of these national enterprises. Uh, free trade, um, you know, opening the markets, um, getting away from localization, getting away from these things that hinder uh, the economy from growing. Um, I know we spoke about this when we had lunch, which was before SOMA. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I was, I guess, naively sort of looking at it in, in a very Canadian perspective, which is, you know, in Canada you've got the Liberals and then you've got the Conservatives. And, and when the Liberals screw up, you put in the Conservatives. And then, you know, we do this. So I was looking at it saying, well, okay, you've got the DA. And, it, and, and you mentioned that some of the limitations that the DA has. Mm -hmm. So if the wild dogs are what are going to do it, um, I guess what I, my question for you is, who's the most likely uh, person to emerge to make the case to South Africans in a way that they can accept uh, that the reforms that need to be made are the kinds of reforms that, that means the government's got to let go of some things. And, and who's likely to be able to do it? Um, and and um, how do you see that playing out and how to, and making that message to South Africans? Mm -hmm. So I guess part of the picture that I'm painting here mm -hmm. is despite what I'm saying about the splintering and fragmentation mm -hmm. of the opposition and of politics in general in South Africa. This is a kind of two-party system set up. I'm mm -hmm. saying that you've got the ANC EFF mm -hmm. world right. on the one side, and you've got the opposition world on the other side. For these opposition parties to be able to keep it together, mm -hmm. they will have to agree on certain principles. Um, they all espouse different values, and they address different voters, mm -hmm. and they must be allowed to do so because voters need that choice. They need that market segmentation kind of choice. But these parties need to agree on some fundamentals. I think that most of them do agree on these fundamentals. Firstly, the rule of law. So I think ANC EFF is not too keen on prosecutions uh, for corruption, for example. Those sorts of things. I think that the wild dog parties will say, well, that's actually not very good. We do need accountability and we do need the rule of law. Another point of differentiation I think is going to be property rights. You say ANC EFF can is in the area of expropriation without compensation, prescribed assets, national health insurance, um, and maybe nationalization of more things if the EFF has anything to say about it. Whereas the other camp says no, property rights are actually really important and you can't grow the economy without investment. Um, and the same, I think, applies to the general assessment of economics. How do you make economies grow? Mm -hmm. I think the ANC EFF is the developmental stage where you say the stage has to be big. It has to be involved, it has to regulate, it has to make things happen, it has to create jobs, it has to help companies export, import, etc., etc. Protect local companies from foreign competition. Whereas the other camp, I think, needs to clarify in its own mind the idea that um, maybe it, it, it represents something like the capable state, mm -hmm. which was used to be the, the, the DA's name, which uh, Mr. Ramposa now also started using, <laughs> uh, together with the development, developmental state. Um, where you'd say, well, you're a capable state, but that means you're facilitating the environment within which business can grow. And that means free trade. That means not so many restrictions, not too many regulations. Make it friendly to investors. I can't point to a single personal party that's going to make that argument. Um, I think it will partly emerge out of discussion and debate between these parties who, if they have any sense at all, should be thinking today about what reforms they want in 2024. They mustn't start the day after the election. They have to think about this now agree on it now. Um, also in terms of managing the coalition, they have to think about that now. Um, we know how difficult it is, but you know, the, the Germans, uh, they took 100, day, 100 days from the date of the election or the announcement of the results mm -hmm. to forming the government. Those 100 days, they used working hours from 9 to 3 every day, weekdays, to negotiate and to write their coalition agreement. After hours, they would still have networking and debates and so on. They took it very, very seriously. And by the time those 100 days were up, they had a 174-page document that described everything. And it says, you know, this is the relationship between the three parties. This is what they stand for. This is the 
policies will endorse in this area. This is how the coalition breaks up. This is how it continues, etc., etc. And you've got to do that work. Um, it's very hard, but I think that's 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 if it happens, that is how it will happen. John, thank you so much uh, once again for an enlightening speech. I think we all got some thinking to do. I think we were challenged today. Uh, but most importantly, I think it's going to influence um, how we conduct our business, how we develop strategy. Greg, this is going to be interesting to you. I'm sure it's going to make you think and your clients at, at, uh, at EPI. Uh, certainly food for thought. Challenged we were. Robust. And I think we once again depend on the integrity the element of research that CRA has become renowned for, uh, not only in South Africa, but indeed on the African continent. So once again, thank you so much, John, for, for your input. It's now my privilege to hand over to Alan Edwards for some concluding, brief concluding remarks and a uh, vote of thanks. Okay. Uh, giving me a microphone and saying keep it brief is very well, nice. <laughs> contradiction to it. Yes, no, thank you so much. Well, that wasn't I'm sorry, I think you should use the main one, Greg. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, John. And it's not the first time I've, I've, I've heard a presentation uh, from CRA, uh, but a again, I come I come away knowing things that I didn't know before I started. Um, you know, first of all, there's there's uh, I, I drive on the Ansel's Drive every day to go to work. Now I know who he was. That's good. Um, <laughs> and uh, and of course, uh, I was in Cape Town last week with my family. And uh, uh, my son kept asking, why are there so many bridges that aren't finished? And so now I know. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm grateful for that. But, uh, but no, I mean, I think what is, is truly the takeaway from this, and I, I really appreciate it, because I mean, some of the scenarios you're, you're laying out are, are, are frightening. Um, but you can't fix what you can't measure. And so I think that's what's really impressive about the CRA and the, the research you do, and, and, and going back even further with the IRR and, and, and the history of being able to measure um, where we're at and accurately be able to say this is what we've got to fix. Um, so for that, I really thank you. I think it's been very, very useful. I really appreciate it. I want to thank Citadel for hosting this. Thank you so much. Uh, and I definitely, uh, perhaps it's quality over quantity. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm very uh, appreciative of that.